Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we hold meetings here every uh, month on various topics, uh, usually to do with libertarianism. <coughs> uh, today, uh, our title is uh, Libertarianism, an extremely short introduction, and it's ah. delivered by John Lester. Thank you. Um, I can't recall that the Libertarian Alliance has ever had a very general introduction to libertarianism. I might be wrong. So having this one seem to be somewhat overdue, how many years have we been going? Decades? Uh, however, this is very much my own approach and doubtless other people would do it rather differently. I start at the more philosophical end and then become more empirical as I go along and possibly uh, easier to understand. The fundamental insight Private property rights, non-impositionally acquired and transferred, all of these terms need to be uh, analysed if you want to get to the bottom of them though, strongly tend to internalise externalities. That is, each owner receives both any benefits and any costs his property produces. As a consequence, such property rights seem to promote two very important things at once. Interpersonal liberty in some sense of people not constraining or imposing on each other and economic efficiency because the tragedy of the commons is solved. We have maximal productivity which strongly tends to be for the common good. Whichever uh, or whatever the various official libertarian theories, some emphasise one aspect and some the other, Nozick and Rothbard going with rights, David Friedman going with economic efficiency, uh, but uh, it's not necessarily to take sides, as we shall see. Anyway, these seem to be the key intuitions, or at least presuppositions, uh, that are behind the libertarian insight. That's on the small scale. On a large scale, there's a radical consequence of this outlook, which is that without state intervention, which in the UK uh, now includes the consumption of about half of the gross, gross national product every year, the ever compounding improvements in the human condition would, within a few generations, make present times seem like a dark age of poverty, barbarism and disease. Rather as uh, South Korea went from a peasant economy to one of the highest per capita countries in only a couple of generations, so we might expect to do something similar. Therefore, as a species, applying libertarianism is more important than anything else except avoiding an existential catastrophe such as a major asteroid strike on the planet, uh, which if, it, if that is possible to avoid at all, uh, libertarian society stands more chance of helping with as it will have greater and more heterogeneous resources. Mainstream Libertarianism's Philosophical Confusion Libertarianism is the subset of classical liberalism that more clearly and consistently advocates human liberty, hence the name, with this being interpreted as entailing tolerance of all purely personal behaviour, for adults at least, and free markets with a minimal state, minarchy or none at all, private property anarchy. Mainstream libertarianism is fairly coherent and cogent on explaining and defending superficial aspects of personal and property issues, especially the economics that are involved. However, it is ultimately profoundly philosophically confused. It conflates various deontological rights, good consequences, property rules and so-called supporting justifications whilst being oblivious to the fact that it has no explicit theory of liberty to explain any of this. Critics 
often point out aspects of this philosophical confusion. Some self-described libertarians sport the fashionable name but abandon actual libertarianism because of the incoherence as they perceive it. In fact, most libertarians do not have much, if anything, to say about liberty as such. However, it is impossible to explain how some types of activity or property or rights are compatible with interpersonal liberty, while others are not, without having an abstract theory of such liberty that is completely independent of any activity or property or rights. Almost no libertarians have any such theory. They have no eleutherology, theory of liberty, as I'm hoping will catch on and become just as important as epistemology very soon. Anyway, that they have no such theory of liberty is as absurd as if almost no utilitarians were to have any theory of utility. In fact, they have a few. New Paradigm Libertarians three-part solution. One, applying critical rationalist epistemology. There are no supporting justifications of empirical theories. They have infinite implications which finite theory-laden evidence cannot support, only test. Neither are there any supporting justifications of any propositions. Arguments entail an infinite regress or circularity or dogmatic starting assumptions. There are only conjectures or assumptions testable within frameworks of conjectures. Hence, libertarianism is unjustifiable, just like every other theory. But it can be explained and defended philosophically and social scientifically in terms of theory, practice and morals. All theories necessarily remain in the realm of criticizable conjectures. Two, not choosing between libertarian rights and welfare consequences or any of the other usual suspects. The two main moral and practical desirables, rights and welfare, have no systematic theoretical or practical clashes. This can be explained and defended by philosophy and the social sciences, especially economics analysis of free market efficiency. And no particular approach is needed to, or logically could, support the libertarian conjecture in any case. The libertarian conjecture needs to be explained and defended in terms of all defensible desirables. Three an explicit, non-moral, non-propertarian, abstract theory of liberty. The absence of proactively imposed interpersonal costs. After explaining and defending this theory of liberty, which will not be done <coughs> here and now, you will be relieved to know, it can be applied to contingent circumstances to deduce all the broad practical implications, which will not be done here and now of having maximum interpersonal liberty, namely self-ownership, physical property, intellectual property, private property anarchy, minimizing clashes of liberty, rectifications of infractions, problem cases, etc. An abstract theory of interpersonal liberty is needed at the center of the libertarian conjecture. Otherwise, you simply have a propertarian fudge which is delicious, but incoherent. I was reading this morning, somebody said, yes, this aggression principle doesn't work, it doesn't work. What can we use instead? Ah, an interference principle. So you move from the nap to the nip. Well, so now you're a little nipper instead of a little napper. What are you going to do to explain what private property has got to do with liberty? There's still no theory of liberty there. Is there's, the intuition is there, you can see that the intuition is there, as it is with the aggression principle. You aggress, so you're not interfering with people, you're not aggressing against them, and here, well, you're not interfering with them instead of aggressing, and that might be a bit clearer. But, in this article, and I won't name names because I don't really want to pick on individuals, uh, he doesn't have a theory of, unless they're big enough to look after themselves, and I'm not sure this fellow is, uh, 
they don't have a theory of liberty, so they really can't explain. They simply moved from one incoherent position to another where the intuitions stay the same. You can see what they're getting at, but because they haven't isolated the problem, which is that what on earth has this got to do with liberty, therefore what is your theory of liberty, they can make no progress. Still philosophical, but becoming more comprehensible, perhaps. Is there tacit consent to the state? Do we tacitly consent to taxation and legislation by living in a country and participating in democracy? And therefore the state's libertarian? No. By analogy, if it is an analogy, we do not consent to crime just because we live in an area where crime is known to exist. Or if we find ways of recovering some of the value of what was stolen from us. And we do not, in fact, have democracy, but elected oligarchy. Calling that representative democracy is somewhat like calling slavery representative self-ownership. If we attempt to minimise any damage that our rulers do by voting for the least bad candidate, then that is not to consent to the damage that the state causes. Admittedly, the state does rest on majority acceptance that it is needed. But this popular error cannot make state aggression either libertarian or legitimate. Is the state useful nevertheless? No. The state provides nothing useful that liberty cannot provide better. The free market uses the price system in particular to guide scarce resources into their most productive uses. Where people agree that help is needed, charity is more efficient and libertarian than state handouts. By contrast, political intervention will inevitably be arbitrary and invasive. It is arbitrary because the state has no economic way of determining what to do, how to do it, or how much to do it. It is invasive because it will necessarily aggress aggressively interfere with people and their property. Thus politics is always a negative sum system that is destructive of wealth and liberty. What about social justice? If social justice means not having damaging and unnecessary social differences in society, then only free market liberty approaches getting us this. For instance, the state, the, sorry, the modern state often uses aggressive coercion to impose both some approach to greater material equality and to prohibit discrimination with respect to a person's race, sex, sexual orientation, the list gets longer every month almost. But the free market itself promotes both of these insofar as they are economic. Competition causes differences in income and profit to be reduced. Any remaining differences are necessary to reward the greater productivity that still exists. And businesses do not discriminate on an arbitrary basis concerning employees or customers, or they would be outcompeted by those that don't. Imposing greater equality and non-discrimination than liberty allows is both unjust and inefficient. Is class conflict a problem? People sometimes complain that the class system is unjust, possibly conflating it with the predominantly caste system which you're born into of the aristocracy. But insofar as individuals and families can achieve varying degrees of socio-economic success under conditions of liberty, such class is what encourages and enables people to be socially productive. However, there is a genuine problem of classical liberal class conflict. There is the class of those people who are net tax and privilege receivers, and they live off the class of those people who are net tax and privilege victims. The tax and privilege receiving parasitic class needs to be abolished so that these people all find productive employment in the free market. 
much more general issues. Education. Before the start of major state involvement in education, the Elementary Education Act of 1870, basic literacy in the UK was already over 90%. Uh, see especially the works of E.G. West on this. The Department of Edu sorry, the Department for Education admits uh, <coughs> that now more than 40% of school leavers are functionally illiterate. At the same time, the state system manipulates examination results to pretend that educational standards are almost always rising. Educational standards will only rise again if the state gets out of the way of education at all levels. That said, a lot of education is mainly a consumer good uh, that, it is, that is wrongly presented as investment in human capital. And the state's attempt to increase <coughs> paper qualifications of all kinds adds to bureaucratic waste. It is a particularly acute problem for libertarianism that the state uses aggressive coercion to monopolise the university and degree system and to fund it. This gives most professional intellectuals privileged status and income, thereby creating a very powerful statist bias. Removing the state from higher education, at least, would fix this. It would also dramatically reduce average student fees. So is a vote winner, as students and their parents far outnumber parasitic academics. Physical infrastructure. This includes such things as roads, railways, water and sewage, power supplies. People have often thought that the free market cannot provide these things efficiently or even at all, but increasingly they are accepted as all being capable of efficient private production. When roads, for instance, are private, as they sometimes are now and were in the past, then tolls can ensure that only the users pay for them, and electronic charging and varying the price can minimise traffic congestion. For many years, the lighthouse was held to be the archetypal non-excludable public good that the state simply had to produce. But we now know that even lighthouses were often provided privately, although always hampered by state assistance that crowded out fully private alternatives. Healthcare. Whether or not it is a sign of medical progress, that people aren't quite as ill as they used to be, not quite so badly, it is significant that there were more hospital beds in the UK before the start of the National Health Service in 1948 than the NHS has beds today. And in 1948, they did not have two administrators for each bed. Compared to the opportunity cost, the best foregone alternative, which is the free market, the NHS is a bottomless pit of waste and poor health care that becomes worse the more tax money it receives. A move towards full private insurance would greatly improve health care. Also, the state regulation of medical qualifications and drugs is a barrier to competition that further keeps down health standards. Welfare payments. Before the state implemented so-called national insurance funded by compulsory contributions, in effect a tax on jobs, people were already opting for a variety of genuine welfare insurance schemes. The state crowded out those private schemes with its own wasteful version. We should not return, sorry, we should return to the voluntary schemes. The tiny percentage of people who would have no insurance or savings uh, and are perceived to be in genuine need would be far better helped by charity. Drug use. States sometimes pick on some voluntary and consensual activities and can declare them to be crimes. The major example of our times is recreational drug use. 
we are told that people suffer ill health and even die from using certain drugs. There are also the harm of harmful effects on others of uh, drug user crime and associated gangsterism. But the usage dangers are grossly exaggerated. Drinking alcohol, smoking tobacco and other legal activities, such as some sports, are statistically more dangerous to health. Many long-term illegal drug users remain in as good health as comparative non-users. To the extent that they do not, this is partly because of the unreliable quality of the drugs caused by the illegality itself. The illegality also reduces the supply of the drugs and so raises their price. And this is what prompts some users to commit crimes to pay for them. A hit of heroin bought from Boots has been calculated to cost you 50 pence if it was a free market. It also attracts sellers who can only operate outside state law, hence all the problem with gangsterism. Environmental problems. All aspects of pollution and species endangerment can be solved if there are full private property rights in all land and seas and oceans, somehow demarcated and policed, we have the technology, and animals, including whales and other charismatic megafauna, with electronic tagging and GPS tracking or whatever. This gives the owners the incentive to look after their resources and allows other people to sue them, possibly via a class action, if they are responsible for negative externalities. Obviously, this would include such things as global warming or climate change, or whatever they've decided to call it at the moment, but I won't go into that but in principle this is all can be dealt with within a private property uh, context. Law and order. Common law that protects people and their property originally involved without the state. It is a form of natural or anarchic law in the same sense that there are natural languages. State, state legislation typically flouts that law and thereby the liberty it protects. And if we include all the security guards, store detectives, night watchmen, doormen and so forth, then state police have always been a minority of policing overall. But state police are a very expensive and inefficient tax parasitic minority that aggress against liberty more than they protect it. A move towards depoliticised law and full private policing would give us the law and order that we largely lack today. National defence. Literally, this means defending the people of a country. This rarely, if ever, happens. At best, Political national defence is more about defending an existing state from a competing state that is hardly any worse, if worse at all, and certainly not worth the death and destruction caused by defending it. But many wars are aggressive attacks on other countries on one pretext or another. The result is invariably vastly more death and destruction than if the attacks had not taken place. This not only applies to recent invasions of other countries, but even more so to becoming involved unnecessarily in the conflicts leading up to and including the World Wars I and II. A voluntarily funded national defence would stick to real national defence. And as we have seen in Vietnam and repeatedly in Afghanistan, just to take two instances, a country with polycentric and grassroots resistance can be impossible to conquer and rule even by a vastly superior power. The state, by contrast, is an Achilles heel of central, centralised control. The way forward. If all this is true, then the state is really a giant criminal organisation. Its taxation is extortion and its legislation is authoritarian. 
and it vastly impedes all desirable human progress. But if we can persuade enough people to see that liberty is the most important social value and that politics is liberty's greatest enemy, then eventually the state can be rolled back. It is true that there has never been a large society without a state. There has never been one without disease either, but both politics and disease are evils that ought to be resisted and reduced as far as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions or criticisms? Be too short. Too short. Too short. Just the right length. No, very good. Short. Very good. Does what it said on the tin. That's very good. I don't want people like you. Get that yes. Yeah, shut you all up, get that. That's good. No, no, criticism. I thought we could always rely on you. There's a lot of content in short time, so. Question here. Uh, so, in your introduction, it was a bit. Complex At the beginning, stuff, so yes. I might have missed a few, but from what I gathered, you were saying that you can't actually define libertarianism, and then you said, and then you just moved on to where it can be applied. So uh, uh, I'm saying this: that mainstream libertarianism has a big problem because it, um, when it tries to explain itself, sometimes it starts talking about rights, and sometimes property rights, and sometimes utility and even though the official focus might be on the property rights even then people talk about the utility and non-aggression and they talk about everything and you and you you're waiting for the explanation of where does the liberty come in here how does why are these property rights consonant with liberty and the ones over here not and i say well the only way you can show that these kind of property rights fit liberty and those ones don't is because you've got a theory of liberty that is nothing to do with property rights or action or anything else and it more or less is the idea that people do not proactively impose on each other that very idea without i'm not going to do any philosophical unpacking now you can just from the very idea that people should not proactively impose on each other we can get the idea that the best way to have this to minimize the extent that we, to which people are imposing on each other is to allow them to own themselves, is to allow them to own property, is to allow them to keep the fruits of their property but not impose externalities on anybody else or their property. Liberty fits those those kind of property, that, 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 that kind of property rights. But the official line of, uh, uh, of uh, Rothbardians, say Blockians, is uh, that, well, it's just a theory of property, really. But if you say it's just a theory of property, uh, a theory of law, uh, and then you know, they want to say, oh, yeah, but it's just. You see, so now they've got property and they've got justice. We still, we still don't know what it, how it relates to liberty. You know, my, my idea is you have a theory of liberty. From, from what liberty is, you can deduce what follows in practice. It's then another question is what follows in practice desirable, morally, and you know, productively. It's a, it's a three-part system. They want to lump it all together in one and say there are just private property rights, uh, it's, uh, uh, and it's libertarian. We can't explain how, but they're, they're private property rights, and they're just. Uh, and I just say, well, that's a mess. You can't explain to anybody who wants to know what it's got to do with liberty if you do it that way. Yeah, I think it's interesting that you define liberty and stuff. I think, yeah, like from what I've understood, mm. you, you define private property, and that that is your first principle. And from that, you can, yeah, you know, that's that's where the whole theory comes from. Yeah, so, but how can you? So, sorry. Is it? But how how can you get the liberty out of the property? I, the liberty is just an effect, but the, the uh -huh. core is the principle, which is private property. Yeah. And, and liberty is just some it's just some notion whatever but the, oh, the yeah. core is is private property but it's yeah. interesting that mm. you know you define liberty and then you try and find something that yeah. would actually you know manifest that via its, yeah you know well i sort of reverse engineered right. the what was going on here i mean i can as i say i think the intuition that libertarians have is they see the private property 
and they see that there's a sense in which it must give us liberty. It does stop people interfering with each other if they own themselves and their own thing. So they can see the liberty there and they can see the efficiency there. But then they tend to leave the liberty behind and just start talking about the private property on its own. They forget their intuitions. But if you look behind the private property, you can make sense of the liberty. You don't need to leave it behind. Uh, and it has to be there in a way. You can't uh, kick it out from underneath you and say, well, now we're, we're just, really, we're just talking about private property. Uh, because what happens then is uh, a lot of philosophers will say, then why do you call yourself a libertarian? And uh, a lot of other people who have non-libertarian theories of liberty will say, well, this is how I define liberty and your private property rights don't fit liberty. And if you don't have a theory of liberty to defend, you can't be something with nothing. <laughs> All you are is a proprietarian. Yes. They actually will have a theory. It might be a socialist theory of liberty, but they've got a theory of liberty. So I, my, what I've been saying for many years now is that libertarians ought to sort out a theory of liberty. It's not that hard to see the way that private property does stop people interfering with each other. Not perfectly. And that's partly what they don't like because uh, the non-aggression principle, they want to say, no, if, if you own something and you do what you like with it and you don't interfere with it, then liberty is perfect. And I'm afraid it doesn't quite work like that. The philosophy behind it is a bit messier. What we have to say is, if you come to own something first and start using it, yes, it should be yours and nobody should take it from you. You are actually restricting their liberty a little bit because had you not been there they could have taken that particular tree and cut it down and used it so uh, but it's the lesser imposition that the first person who gets it uses it than if we allow the second person to take over and make him move on so it's so private property doesn't give you perfect liberty but it gives us as much as it's possible to have given that we all have to live together and we will always be in danger of getting in each other's way. So isn't that a bit like uh, utilitarian where they define their philosophy based on utility and you define it based on liber liberty but the, in that case mm -hmm. what I like with libertarianism in the mm -hmm. private where, where, where you, yeah. you just define what private property is and everything comes from that Whereas with this other one, you have yeah. to maximise liberty, like yep. maximising utilisation. And isn't that, isn't that, I thought, it's just quite difficult. It's, it's, not, it's, not, a consequentialist, process, it's not a consequentialist theory, though it might look like it. It just says, what do you do when there are inevitable clashes of liberty? Uh, 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 maybe a clearer example are, uh, is um, the, uh, the, the smoke from my fire, you're upwind of it, and... Uh, it you know interferes with your where you live or whatever. So uh, I, if I have my fire, it interferes with you. If I'm not allowed to have my fire by whatever means, uh, then I can't have warmth and cooking. So whichever way you go, one of us is going to be a nuisance to the other. If I have the fire or I'm not allowed to have it, uh, that's the sort of clash that you get, and you you find a private property solution to it. Now, it's not designed to maximise everybody's liberty in a completely universal way. Well, utilitarianism is just about maximising the utility, and you can do anything to anybody to maximise it. It's just what you do when there are specific clashes. How do you solve the specific clash? Well, I think those clashes are inevitable. I don't see how you can simply... I said the, the libertarian intuition is there. People can see that property does promote liberty. And that's what makes it attractive, partly what makes it attractive, apart from the all the productivity. As I said, you get buy one, get one free with this ideology. Property gives you both. It's marvellous. Why leave behind the liberty and say, oh, no, we don't need that anymore. We just do it in terms of property. It's, it's sort of less messy because philosophy is a bit messy. Uh, you can no longer say that we have perfect non-aggression, but then once you stick with the non-aggression principle, you get all the paradoxes of the non-aggression principle. Uh, how can you do anything whatsoever uh, where there's the tiniest little bit of 
imposition or aggression against other people. Now, if you have a theory of liberty, you can explain how, when you've got clashes like that, you've just got to minimise them in the most reasonable way that's possible. Yeah, or once with, I, by with private property, like these minimal things like, say, radiation, you know, if you just if I switch on my TV, there's radiation that comes, you know, and that affects everybody in the world to some yeah, extent. You know? Yeah, yeah. So, well, in a sense, with private property, you would say my property is being affected by this radiation, yeah. but it's so minimal that the compensation I would owe you would be the same that I'm causing on you. So yeah. It, well, 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 it'd be, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's that, or the fact that, I mean, if we say, or traffic, I mean, there might be pollution from traffic, but uh, the, we, we've, we've, we can look at the extreme, you know, either you don't allow anybody to drive any vehicles anywhere because there will always be some pollution, in which case that's a terrible imposition on the people who would like to drive vehicles and it would actually uh, undermine the economy to a considerable extent if you can't move around in vehicles with, you know, powered by diesel or petrol or whatever. Uh, so whichever way you're going to have to go, there's going to be some, but you've got to say, well, in the circumstances, uh, what will minimise the imposition? It's less of an imposition to say, well, look, if you really hate breathing in fumes so much, maybe you shouldn't live in central London. You can go and live somewhere where these fumes will barely reach you by the time you're there. And that, because otherwise, everybody else has to give up what they have which is a fantastic imposition upon them. It's a constraint on what they're trying to do. That's, that's the idea. It's, it's, it's a much less constraint on you to say, well, why don't you go and live in Wales and, or wherever? And so you have to go for the lesser constraint. It's sort of unavoidable. And the, but without, when you have the principle of liberty, you can explain how we can minimize the clash. If you haven't got the principle of liberty, you've just got the non-aggression principle, you really you can't get beyond it. You you can you've got to um, come up with something sort of arbitrary that officially fits the non-aggression principle. It doesn't really fit the non-aggression principle because you are aggressive. Uh, so I, I think you can't get away from liberty, and you shouldn't want to. The only but they're slippery in all kinds of ways because once you've deduced self-ownership and. Um, private property you know then you get difficult cases like what happens if you just got to the waterhole before anybody else five minutes before you know and again with the theory of liberty though you can say well yep yeah, for you to say I now own this waterhole and everybody else who arrives five minutes later must uh, do and pay whatever I say or they don't get any water I was say given that you didn't create the water um, you are imposing on them more by claiming a property right in that water hole uh, than they would by saying, well, no, you know, you've not created anything here. You're just monopolizing something that you had to stumble, stumble across a few minutes early. So time after time, you will get problems cropping up where you want to know, well, what would be the most libertarian thing to do in these circumstances. And you can't simply say, well, uh, this was homesteaded five minutes ago, so he can charge what he likes. It's his, and he's not interfering with anybody at all. I oh, said, that doesn't make sense, of course he is. He just happened to be here five minutes ago. He didn't dig the water hole. He happened to stumble across it. All these other people who are equally lost and were lost with him five minutes ago. You know, so, uh, but libertarians, uh, in my experience, just don't want to go down that route. Uh, and the libertarians who want to have a theory of liberty, of all the theories of liberty to have, they tend to go for uh, something like the Hobbesian one, which is that um, any constraint on you whatsoever by other people is a constraint on your liberty. So if I want to punch you on your nose and you want to stop me, that's a constraint on my liberty by the Hobbesian view. Steiner is a Hobbesian. Um, and people who adopt the Hobbesian view say, ah, oh, yeah, but we want that pattern of liberties or that list of liberties where people um, 
find them most useful or most enjoyable. But then you see you haven't got a you haven't got a theory of liberty anymore, really. You've just got the th a theory of useful liberties means you're not maximizing liberty anymore. You're maximizing utilitarianism if you're maximizing useful liberties. So I don't think they really have a theory of liberty, even though they do, because it doesn't work out as a, a libertarian theory of liberty. It's just a bit arbitrary to call it liberty at all, that, uh, the Hobbesian variety. Yeah. Well, is it not possible for a society to become more and more liberal without agreeing on the meaning of liberality or liberty? They just know what isn't. It's impossible. And strike it down. Sorry. Or do yeah, yeah. It's, it's possible for people to do uh, things without having a theory in the background of what they're doing. Um, Making bait. Of course, yeah. People did that before they even knew how it worked. <laughs> uh, it is possible, but um, occasionally, uh, you know, problems arise, uh, theoretical problems, and other people will say, uh, raise objections and things need to be explained and there's a purpose to it any you I mean you don't necessarily need science but sometimes science is useful uh, you might be lucky enough not to need it um, uh, you can muddle along I'm not saying that it's uh, what I always say about philosophy is that uh, it's nowhere near as important as economics but only in the same sense that economics is nowhere near as important as taking away the rubbish. Because if people didn't take out the rubbish away from outside your house, we'd all be in deep trouble very, very quickly. And we need some economics as well to explain. Um, so, so it's philosophy is the uh, uh, sort of cherry on the cake of civilization, but it does useful things. Um. Yes. yes. I was very interested in your waterhole analogy. Mm. How do you handle first ownership where people still, you know, the Middle East has got all the oil and the tribe that's near the <coughs> best fishing rights has that? Mm. The first person to have it or the first group to have, have it, why do they deserve it? Well, um, You know, arguably, given my theory, there is a libertarian case that, you know, if you do just happen to stumble upon something like that, uh, and other people would have stumbled upon it eventually anyway, then uh, you maybe your uh, rights in it will diminish proportionally over time in proportion as the likelihood the rise is that other people would have found it anyway and and therefore some competition would be introduced. I mean, I have a similar approach to uh, intellectual property. If you create something, a piece of intellectual property, uh, you shouldn't be able to own it for more than the likely independent discovery or invention by somebody else of that. Because if you do, then you're keeping more than the value that you've created. Uh, so, but th I don't deny that one of the consequences of this theory of liberty is that it does seem to fly in the face of what people normally understand by uh, private property rights. You know, even now people think, well, that's your country, that's your oil and whatever. There's a certain amount of nationalism there, of course, built in. As, and I think, well, so no, if you follow out the consequences of this theory of liberty, there will eventually be some changes. It will change things. It's more precise than what we have at the moment. Um, I don't shy away from that. But that said, I mean, the, the, the world does seem to be full of oil. I mean, they're getting it all over the place, aren't they? I mean, I don't... I mean, they do seem well, to have... All right, then, another, like, rare earth elements that use some of our phones, very specific areas. Yeah. Well, in that case, I, I would definitely come back to the idea that you're entitled to monopolise that in principle for as long as a likely independent discovery would have been. So if there are a lot of people prospecting in the area, um, yeah, the general, say, they, uh, say they think expert panel of 
of um, property judges say that we think that in about five years that would have been discovered anyway. Then, but we can't say by who. Um, then you're, you can only have a right to it for that five year because you've created that value by finding it five years earlier. So fine, you get that. And then after that five years, there's going to have to be some other... I haven't worked out all the details. One of the reasons I haven't is because my theory is so eccentric and uh, uh, unusual and I only have... And I'm the only one... I'm the only person who ever thinks about it. Isn't I've got... That, isn't that government, though? Yeah, you do. Isn't that government? Sorry, isn't what government? Isn't that the state? You mean? Oh, no, 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 no. I mean, when you go to when you uh, go to an arbitration agency to uh, test your property rights, it'll be a private arbitration agency uh, in a culture, which, if it's a libertarian society, it's a libertarian culture. People will know that um, the final first principle uh, behind all property rights is that those property rights respect liberty, and therefore, when there's a lack of clarity uh, or, or a, a, a sort of libertarian challenge, then that, you know, it has to go to court and then be discussed. Now, I think it's clearer with um, intellectual property. I think you can understand the idea because you've, you've just got there a bit sooner. It's less usual with uh, physical property because people don't normally think of it that way. They, the idea that you were there first means you only get it for a certain period of time is not the way that people normally do it. So it would be quite radically different. But if it fits the theory and I follow the argument wherever it leads. But no, but no it's definitely not government. It's inde independent private arbitration agencies in a culture of libertarianism where people are, where uh, you agree to be bound by the arbitration and so forth, you're not going to have a fight over it. David? It might be said that the problem with the, the natural resource case is not that the Arabs found the oil first, they may not have found it at all. Yeah. The problem is that they own the land upon which it was found. So it's not clear that a sort of who finds it first test would really work. Well, um, See, this is where uh, Bloch is very good on these things. The Bloch is very good on economics. Now, on economics, this is the Bloch. On the philosophy behind libertarianism, no, forget it. Uh, and he, he said, he says, uh, it's uh, the um, the old-fashioned view of ownership was um, ad colum. Uh, ad inferos to the heavens and to hell and you move on to a piece of land you own it up to the heavens and down to hell he said no you don't you're not using it up to the heavens if, so, if somebody flies over you weren't using the land up there your the space if their, their plane flies over if somebody digs underneath you and finds oil um, you weren't doing anything down there I mean, it's arbitrary to say that you own everything above you and everything below you as it is to say, I own everything to the right of me and everything to the left of me. Why? You're not using it. You're, 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 you've got a property claim to what you're using. So, um, of course, libertarianism wouldn't allow the existence of a nation state to own the land as a nation state anyway. Uh, everybody owns their own house or business or whatever. Um, but certainly, just because I'm up here and this is mine, does not mean a hundred feet below me is mine. Uh, I think that I think I think that has to be right. Uh, uh, and now you, you get yes, and you get a claim to what you start using. Um, I'm not quite sure what the history of finding all this oil was. I've never really looked into it. Uh, I don't, maybe somebody knows. Oh, well, there you go then. It's British. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But uh, it, well, that would uh, it would certainly follow that you know if the state was illegitimate and the state sort of granted them the right to look for it, um, really, uh, and then took it away again. You know, it's uh, uh, 
Once we have the big libertarian revolution, which will be wonderfully peaceful and friendly, nobody gets killed, there will have to be a working out of details like this. And it'll get very, very complicated because we're moving into a different legal system where not, it's not, it might look like people and property are going to be respected. And that's a lot simpler. Well, it is a lot simpler except for when you get down to the problem cases and you say yeah but it's not really about people and property it's about liberty and, it's the, and there's a liberty behind the and therefore if some piece of property doesn't actually fit liberty we've got to find out in principle and this is where all we uh, philosophers are going to get paid as f philosophical um, judges and uh, See, I didn't even need to learn the Latin. You paid a penny for our thoughts. They didn't need to learn the Latin in the incredibly hard judging exams, which I'm sure I would have failed. Uh, now, when that's going to happen, I don't know. Yeah, so if you don't own what's above you, like leaving yourself wide open to um, lack of privacy, if you don't own what's underneath you, can't someone just build a tube line? And destroy your foundations to your sample. Well, it, 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 it's a question of how, how question is how far they... Don't you end up with, with an arbitrary number? It's, the, uh, um, it's a question of uh, how far they're being a nuisance to you by doing these things. If they, if the tube line, I mean, I used to live in a flat where the tube line was below my flat, um, but it was so far below I couldn't hear anything even when a bomb went off, literally, in the tube line. Uh, so that didn't bother me, it was no bother. And, and an aeroplane flies over. Obviously, the nearer it gets, then you start having a conflict. And then you... Am I, am I inside? Was it privacy? Uh, I th up to a point. Um, what are they called? Um, drones? Yes, drones. drones, yeah. I mean, yeah, I think, I mean, but then we have to look at the, we say, we look at what's being done, drones or whatever, and we say, there are two sides to this. If you say to people you can never fly drones, that's an imposition on them if they want to fly them and do deliveries and whatever. On the other hand, if they do fly them, there's the possibility of being a nuisance to other people. And you have to say, here is a new phenomenon. Whether we ban it or whether we allow it is going to cause uh, some people to be imposed on. Maybe there is some sort of compromise point where we minimise the imposition at least. Uh, that it's, you know we allow it along certain flight routes, where so people can do their deliveries, but they can't just bot buzz people's uh, houses and go into their back gardens. And that's because they're there. You're just being a nuisance to people. You're not. You're not. You know, trying to uh, do your. Uh, delivery that you've been asked to do where, where you could just fly up the high street and along the along down their road and then into their house you're doing things which clearly are just a nuisance but the details will have to be uh, adjudicated every time something new happens you have to say what are we going to do about this from a libertarian point of view it's not just obvious um, Maybe it's something should be banned completely because they're so dangerous or they can't be done within uh, so many miles of uh, a built up area. Maybe other things, really, there's nothing to worry about and uh, people are complaining about nothing. Um, you know. It just, you've got to look into the physics and the, uh, the circumstances. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's technology moves on. You can be higher and higher now. Yeah. And impose more and more on someone's privacy. Well, in that case, well, yeah, but if if what for well, if you're if you're spying on them, for instance, uh, well, yes, I think you have some uh, claim not to be spied on if you're sitting in your back garden. I think people would say that uh, uh, that would go to court. You know, I mean, I'm I'm sympathetic to the idea, though I haven't really worked it out in sort of detail that people have some sort of a right to um, their own image uh, and if they're maybe if you're walking down the public road even if it's a private road and the private road says cameras are present then you can't complain but otherwise 
you know, I think whenever I see celebrities being you know, photographed and often in when they're on private property, I think this seems a bit of an imposition to me. I think you are you are being a nuisance to these people. I know other people want to buy your magazine uh, uh, and so forth, and there's a big public demand for it, but it looks to me like these people are sitting in their private property. Uh, why should they have to put an enormous wall up just to stop you being a nuisance and photographing them? I think you're being more of a nuisance by photographing them than they would by saying you can't do this. So, and I think that might fall out of what is actually the more libertarian option. Though, you can only do that with a theory of liberty. First of all, we'll touch behind you and then you know. Just a quick one. What, what does libertarian say about really dangerous things like guns? I, mean, I, I feel aggrieved that I can't have a gun. I don't want one, but I... <laughs> I don't want one, but I really want to be able to have one if I did want one. Got it. Must keep you awake at night. Okay. Well, I take um, um, a lot of libertarians, especially in America, tend to be pro-gun, and an awful lot of people in England tend to be uh, pro-gun. My line is you privatise all the streets and then you see what the street owners decide. Now, in my street, I would not want, and I would expect most of the people on the street committee, you know, but once you're, once you, all the streets are privatised, it's like, it's like living in a block of flats where you've all got flats and then you've got common areas. You've got to have a committee to, and rules to work out what is allowed in the common areas, when they get redecorated, who pays for it and so forth, what's not allowed, who has a key, so similarly, once the ownership of the streets is given to the people who have the houses in the streets, they're going to have to come up with rules. I wouldn't expect many people to say, in our street, anything goes, yeah, guns, prostitutes, drugs, who cares? No rules. They're not the same. Guns and prostitutes are not the same. No. Oh, no, 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 I would expect, these are the kind of things I would expect people to say that we don't want. Most people, if you are an ordinary family... Guns are less dangerous. <laughs> yes. If you're an ordinary family living in a, 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 an area with other ordinary families and you, you make up the rules for the streets, they're likely to be the kind of rules that you wouldn't have for the common parts of a block of flats if you lived in it. And I think that, I, my guess is people would say, well, no, you can't carry guns around. Ex maybe our security guards can, just in case there's somebody with it. But otherwise, no, you can't, and you can't have drugs, and you can't, and then it's just, yes. Yes. First of all, David. David? But, I mean, that's just, my, but the point is, if you wanted in your street to have guns, and everybody else in them wanted in that street, then there would be no problem. That's why, the general big libertarian uh, intuition of ways private property solves problems without getting into all the philosophy of it and what liberty is and how liberty fits in and uh, is, but generally speaking what's the solution to this uh, political problem about all of these people demonstrating and all these people uh, uh, fighting with them is well let the area be privatised, let the owner of the area decide who can march there and who can't march there, and that just solves the problem. It ceases to be a political conflict and instead becomes private property peace, where the owner simply decides what's, what's happens there. So I think the owner would just, but you and your friends can all live in Gun Alley. I don't know if I'll visit I'd you like very to, often. I'd, I'd like to visit there and shoot, have some fun, but I yeah. wouldn't live there myself. <laughs> But anyway, that's, I think that's the solution. But then, you, but then there's a second level is, given that we don't have private streets, what should the state do? And I would then I would say, if we, given that we don't have private streets, probably what the state would do is what we, our best guess is, what the market would do. And, but then that comes much more controversial, what, what the market would do. People could disagree completely about what the market would do. But that's, the, that's only the second level. If we're trying to explain libertarianism to people, we're, we don't need to get into what should the state do given that we can't have private property. We ought to be explaining to them how much better things would be if we did have private property and the problem would just be solved. So let's not worry too much about um, 
uh, the, the compromise, what the right compromise is. Let's just get the theory right and worry about the compromise later. David? I think you might just have asked the question, but I'll ask you anyway, just, just in case you haven't. Yeah. Uh, is what makes a law and material what it is, or where it has come from and how it's been made? Yes. <laughs> no, it, it, it could be, it, it, it all depends on the background situation, whether which of those might or might not apply. Uh, I mean, th there's, a principle, there's a principle of liberty, but that principle of liberty might exist in a particular historical context which influences what is acceptable in libertarian terms uh, 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 and in a different historical or cultural context you might have a different answer. Uh, Suppose, for example, the Parliament yeah. formed a committee to think about drones and infringement of privacy. Yeah. And the committee that's formed has read your book, and uh, they all agree it's absolutely splendid. Yeah. And that's the principle that they're going to apply. Yeah. And they come up with a principle. Sorry, when they propose more, they say, the best we can do is try to balance yeah. the imposition upon people being flown over. Yeah. But on the other hand, all those people who want their Amazon deliveries nice and quick, and so on. So yes. So we're going. We think probably uh, 200 feet in the country and 100 feet in urban areas. Yeah. We propose that. Uh, do you evaluate the libertarianness of that by saying, "Yeah, you've done quite a good job. You apply the right principles, more or less right," yeah. or you say, "That's come from Parliament. It's a state body. That can't. That just can't be libertarian." The whole method that that law has come in into existence is just the wrong method. I know. Oh no! I mean, I, I, given that the state owns all the roads and makes up the rules, and I think the way we're going to get to libertarianism is by the intellectuals becoming libertarians and then giving their libertarian advice to the politicians who slowly introduce more and more libertarian methods to achieve things. I mean, uh, it would be ridiculous to say, no, we must smash the state and have libertarianism. No, you're not going to have it that way. It's, uh, you've got, it's going to be gradualist and... Um, so uh, one can't say legislation as such is a bad uh, uh, can, you can, I mean, no, no, because legislation, <laughs> strictly speaking, can approximate. Given that you don't have private property and a libertarian, full libertarian culture, legislation can approximate more or less that to what right. is libertarian. Which was your earlier answer, really, was sort of what market yeah, would produce. That sounds like a utilitarian justification. Uh, so, sorry. Well, that sounds like a utilitarian justification. There's greater gain from permitting yeah, this. They, well, yeah, well, the greater, well, they're, they're, um, it's, yes, there's more liberty, but it's not utility, it's liberty. So it's not u utilitarian, it's libertarian. But also it's not, it's not, um, it's not, if I say that the, uh, the government, it would be better if the government, given two policies, one is more libertarian than the other, I think it would be better that the government introduced the more libertarian policy. That doesn't mean that I'm committed to a kind of uh, libertarian consequentialism in a way that overrides anybody's rights. Whilst if you're a utilitarian, all that matters is use utility. You can do anything to anybody as long as you maximize utility. <laughs> I'm not saying you can do anything to anybody as long as you maximize liberty. I'm saying in the event of specific clashes you go for the more libertarian one that's not a, that's not a, a consequentialist libertarianism well you're talking don't you so you understand add to what you're saying you then afterwards you step over and i think in that answer you've actually understated uh, the width and power of your conjecture because your conjecture is that there aren't any practical clashes that uh, when you are assessing 
uh, where you can or how you can best maximize liberty, yeah. the answer is not actually going to result in infringements of rights to our No, no, no. Oh, I know. So I know. if that's wrong, that one gets oh, yeah. into the question, well, that maximizes liberty, that maximizes utility, yeah. they're different, what are we going to yeah. do? Yeah. I mean, I don't think so they I clash, but it, actually, the thing is, in, in theory, a I mean, in theory, know. utilitarianism allows for the overriding of rights uh, 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 in order to maximise or overriding of liberty. You can do anything to anybody. In theory, but and I, but I, I, but I equally, yeah. In theory, maximising liberty could reduce utility. Oh, it could it do. Could make us all much much worse. It off. could do. It just it's just a, a very sort of happy coincidence. But 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 you but it's not entirely it's not it's not it's not an unbelievably <laughs> sorry it's not an unbelievably remarkable coincidence when you think about it that that um, by uh, uh, allowing people to own themselves and uh, and and own things and yet not impose <coughs> on anybody else's personal property that they both are less constrained themselves by other people and less constraining on other people and are able to be more productive because I mean these things it it's not like how did that happen who would have believed that you could have had liberty and productivity it at the same time that yeah, but, uh, liberty and utility might be quite closely linked well, yes they are yeah. you, you too. maximising liberty also allows for maximising utility and if that is not a coincidence there must be some quite important. Utilitarianism well, is, a, is a liberal idea in the liberal tradition. Okay. Yeah. Stuart Mill and so on, John Stuart Mill. But, uh, are we finished, David? Yeah. Well, just, no, it's, uh, well, I mean, we, we can see how it works, though. I mean, we can see how the same mechanism just does solve the tragedy of the commons and internalising externalities solves the tragedy of the commons and stops you interfering with each other. When you see that, you think you, I can't see how you can see that and think, God, that's amazing. It's how can it do both at once? It just because it just uh, looks. Where does the causation run? Does it run from liberty to utility, or from utility to liberty, or is there some further underlying thing that gives you both? Uh, no, no, it, it, the private property, Sorry, the, well, the internalization of externalities from private property, simply. It simply just seems to do both at once. It's two, sort of like two ways of looking at the same thing. It, uh, it, uh, look at it this way, and it's that's liberty, and I look at it that way, and it's very productive. Um, I mean, I only really came up with this way of uh, explaining the fundamental libertarian intuition uh, in the last few days while I was thinking about this talk. I thought that that is the intuition that is behind everybody's official theory, whatever their official theory is. And and yet, and so it is bizarre when somebody has that intuition, and that's what sort of converts them to libertarianism, and then they, they throw away the utility and say, right, though the heavens fall. Or, like David Friedman, they say, I can make no sense of liberty and philosophy, utility and efficiency, that's what we're, all we're after. So I, Again, you don't need to take those sides, but people like to take sides. They they think it's necessary because they think they also think if you have, haven't taken sides, then how have you justified yourself? You have to justify again the big epistemological error. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Sorry, 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 yeah. sorry, sorry, but I'd like to bring you in. But uh, you're finished. Uh, what about this chap here? Uh, you're finished, Bob. Right. Bob? Yeah. Um, it could be a piquant, piquant, piquant kind of paradox that you, you get more personal liberty by selling it to other people as a way of getting greater utility uh, per person, or at least as far as they're concerned, more uh, a better likelihood of they and people they care for. So, sorry, so, sorry, what are you selling? I'm saying that you might. People might end up with more liberties in the way you describe it, yeah. even though they were, it was explained to them that they should allow more and more personal liberty because of the utilitarian consequences. Yes. In other words, they may not care much for liberty. Oh, yeah. 
and yet get more of it and get more yeah, yeah. Well, uh, this is one of the reasons I say there are different then what are mistaken for justifications are usually explanations. So when somebody says to me, how will libertarianism work? You can tell different stories. One story is liberty and autonomy. And if somebody else likes that story, that explanation, they say, oh, you've justified it. Anybody else who's watching who doesn't like that story says, what do you mean? That's not a justification. That's ridiculous. Uh, 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 and you, then you may tell him a story about the consequences and the welfare consequences. He's, ah, now you've justified it. Well, you haven't. You've simply explained how you think it works. And it might work, but, but the contractarian or the um, uh, people who think it's all about flourishing, eudaimonians, yeah, eudaimonists. Anyway, uh, again, they want another story. But you can... It, you can you can go down any of these routes and uh, say, well, I think it works like this and this and this in this way, and this and this and this, and, this. and they're just different conjectural explanations. They're based on assumptions and a general picture. Of course, it's what you're giving is a completely universal explanation based on probably often just a, an assumption or two and hardly any observations at all. So, you know, that a universal theory like that could be any kind of a justification. It doesn't make any sense. It's, it's simply a conjectural explanation. And the conjectural explanations that people like, they are inclined to call justifications. And they shouldn't. They simply say, oh, I like that explanation. No, rather, that's what I like about libertarianism. I like all the utility. Somebody else says, no, I like the fact that those are the systems of rules that we would all agree to if we were reasonable and we wanted to get on with each other. And that, for me, that's what makes it fair. I want it to be fair for the common good and the rules that we would agree to. I was only thinking about this today. Um, you can do a lot on the contractual basis without mentioning any... Uh, interpersonal comparisons of conflict simply on the basis of what rule would be reasonable uh, for any individual to have and one rule I mean, would you like a rule where anybody can interfere with anybody else at any time and you might think oh well, that'd be nice to be able to interfere with anybody else and then you think hang on a minute that means they could interfere with me oh no I don't like that rule uh, I prefer a rule where you can't interfere with people you do the same thing with external property. I prefer a rule where once you've acquired it without stealing it or anything else, nobody can take it from you. Uh, because even though it might be convenient to take it from other people, uh, I'd rather they didn't take it from me, and therefore I'll go for it. And similarly, you can do the same thing with all libertarian rules and show that they're the rules that any self-interested person, reasonable self-interested person, would agree to. <coughs> In which case, you then don't need to discuss... Uh, clashes of liberty and co can compare them and say who suffers more the person whose fire is not allowed or the person who has to put up with the smoke you simply look at the rule and say which rule as regards having fires that cause a lot of smoke would a reasonable person want and therefore you can completely avoid maybe I was only just thinking about this there's a there's a contractarian approach where you don't need to avoid into uh, clashes of uh, uh, imposed costs. You can get out of the subjective element, um, which uh, I'm not quite sure if you can do that entirely, though, but that's another way of doing it. That's, uh, it's like Rawls, John Rawls' original position. Yeah. It's your turn to speak. Quite possibly a stupid question. To what extent do children have liberties? I was wondering, uh, what, what, what about uh, parents who refuse life-saving life life drug transfusion for their kids, yeah. maybe because of religious reasons? Uh, uh, yeah, I think, I, th I think the general libertarian line is that um, parents have a right and duty of care, which is a kind of property right. Um, but you don't own your children as chattel. Um, and they start out being semi-autonomous and then become more and more and more autonomous until you you say that at a certain age, or maybe you give them a, 
you know, a psychological test or something. Are you ready f to be considered to be an adult? Uh, if you sit the test and pass it, then okay. Now you now you can sign a contract and buy a car. And maybe you're only ten, but you're so advanced for your age. But at the moment, I don't know. Uh, I don't. There are not very many libertarians who don't think that um, there should be age limits and it's, it's approximate. It's a convention, but it's not completely arbitrary because you know any lower than that and your very young people will do uh, be at risk for one reason or another and any higher than that and you're just constraining people who are really adults. Uh, but then, uh, so I don't think that the problem of age limits is in any way peculiar problem for libertarians than it is for anybody else. Uh, except for, there are some libertarians who think that uh, you coerce children by making them eat their greens and sending them to bed if they don't do what they're told and uh, the taking children seriously movement. Uh, uh, so uh, they would uh, they would have a slightly different line. They define coercion a bit differently to the way I would define coercion. And uh, um, uh, for instance, I mean, one I, I said, you know, if you saw a child, if I saw a tiny child about to put his hand on the electric fire, I would not hesitate to pull that child away. And if the child kept going back to the electric fire, I might give it a little slap just so it remembered that's very very dangerous and you know for the child's benefit uh, they would say no no you mustn't do that I don't want to turn the fire off and freeze I don't know what their solution is I can, but you know so but otherwise libertarians are more or less the same except I think that if you did have a libertarian society I think it might be slightly more likely to allow for the possibility of something like a psychological test for proof of um, maturity. Because at the moment, uh, I mean, the state is ham-fisted. It makes a law and it's the law of the land and that's for everybody, shut up. That's it. Uh, in a libertarian society, especially where there are different communities, there's, I think there's room for a bit more flexibility. And, you know, we allow that thing at, over here, at that age. And I think the age of consent in Portugal is about 13, which I always thought this is a bit odd because does this mean, I've not looked into it, if some, could somebody go to Portugal, do something legal over there and then come back here and be arrested as a paedophile? I'm not sure how that would work, uh, but definitely age limits for age of consent which of course is not the age of majority, which is not the age of criminal responsibility. These things are all distinguished. I think you can put a libertarian um, interpretation on these things and it's likely to be much more refined and uh, heterogeneous than what we have now. Can't say any more than that, I've found. Okay. Yeah, you, you, you just said that um, uh, people would choose the general rule that it seems beneficial, like uh, you don't interfere with me and this is a better uh, rule than uh, yeah. uh, everyone interfering with you. Yeah. But how do you convince people that there needs to be one rule for everyone, which, uh, I mean, if you look through throughout your history in, in all societies, that didn't, that doesn't seem to be the standard that, that everyone has the same same rules. And it, it still isn't, isn't really... Um, uh, resonating with, with a lot of people. I mean, I'm, I'm very passionate, for, as you know, about open borders, for example. Mm -hmm. And I always make arguments like, look, everyone should have the same rights, you know? Uh, it doesn't matter where you were born or which yeah. citizen you are, there should be one rights for everyone. And that is the key thing that, that people just th find completely crazy, that, that, that people should, uh, you, you shouldn't differentiate between groups of people having different 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 mm -hmm. rights. You, you can't explain that to a lot of people, that, yeah. that there should be one rule for everyone. Uh, and. and Instead, they think there should be different rules for different groups of people. And, yeah. and what is your approach to say, well, it would be really good if everyone had the same, same right. Because if you are in a privileged yeah. group, you might think, well, this, this works well for you. Yeah, I was actually thinking uh, 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 at the most fundamental level, in a pre propertarian society, where we're arguing about what rules are we going to have, and we're going to... Uh, 
people are going to come up with the rule that uh, you have exclusive control over yourself, which, once that's institutionalised, we call property. I mean, you, you don't actually have to have the institution of the law. You, you could simply respect that rule that you control yourself and don't interfere with each other. But we make that property because we, in an imperfect society we need laws and police and so forth and therefore we actually institutionalize it probably and then uh, also that's self-ownership and we do the same thing with uh, coming to own external resources and that you can then do what you like with the external resources insofar as that doesn't clash with the principle of liberty itself which very occasionally it will and maybe those Arabs are doing it I don't know I have to think about that um, and then after that there isn't much else because after that you own yourself you own the land you make up the rules as you go along and it's your land and you make up the rules <laughs> now now the thing about allowing people in well um, if all the again I come back to private property solves the problem if all the land is owned then the people who own the land can say well they can come into our bit and somebody else say well they can't come into our bit and Problem solved. Yeah, you, you can invite them over, and if you want, and they're and they're all living in your <laughs> land, which could be a big piece of land, working for you yeah, in a factory. Yeah, no, no, that, 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 that makes sense. But um, underlying all of this is yeah. this assumption that there needs to be a general rule. And, and why not? Why not say, look, let's say there were no rules. We're at the very beginning. No, no one knows anything about rules. Why not make a rule like no one interferes with me, yeah. but I can interfere with you. That seems like a good rule for, for me. It's not so good for you, yeah, yeah. but it is it's good for me. And throughout history, amazingly, these kind of rules always come up. People always have some way to convince people to follow this kind of uh, kind of method by, by getting enough people on, on their own side, and then yeah. you have a I small mean, minority yeah. that you interfere with. So yeah, I mean, I didn't really uh, sort of depict the uh, the circumstances of the contract clearly enough but it's it's a circumstance where the rule that you pick is um, got to be universalizable because you're not in a you're not capable of defending yourself yet and uh, so it, 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 it has to be a rule such that if somebody else were to adopt that rule with respect to you you would put you would put up with it so it has to be for the common good maybe which is to say, it's in everybody's interest. Self-ownership is in everybody's interest. Owning things is in everybody's interest. Uh, I've never really gone down the line of contractarian to, to, to work this out and see exact. I mean, I've read some contractarian uh, things. Jan Narvison is a contractarian uh, uh, who thinks that's how you work out what the libertarian thing to do is. And I was only just recently thinking that you, you probably could go a long way. But again, it wouldn't be a just, he thinks it's a justification. I would say, no, that's just another way of explaining it. Yeah. You can explain it that way. You haven't justified anything. You've simply got a few assumptions and said, you could think of it this way. You could look at it this way. It's as though everybody came up with rules that they wouldn't mind having them impose them. Yeah, you could. And that sounds sort of fair. Yeah, I think that sounds sort of fair. That's one way of looking at it. It's not a justification, though. Uh, uh, yeah, but I, I don't... You just you can't come up with a rule. I can do anything I like and nobody can touch me. Because, obviously, that's going to have to be built into the original conditions that those kind of rules wouldn't count uh, because nobody would agree with. It's got to be the kind of rules that people will agree with. And nobody else is... Nobody's going to agree with that rule. If you've got a lot of reasonable people in a room, reasonable, self-interested, utility maximizers, nobody, they're not all going to agree, yes, Nico can do that and we'll just do whatever he says. They've got their own interests, they won't allow it, so they'll they'll only allow the kind of rule which would be a libertarian rule. Yeah, but why do they have to agree? Why do they have to agree? Well, I said, I haven't really thought long and hard about contractarianism. I thought long and hard about what liberty is, and what it implies, but I haven't thought long and hard about how far you can get that out of a contract. I've only just started thinking about that recently. Now, there's four speakers. Uh, Dominique, this chap, 
and this chap, and then let that left. So that's four. So yes, that's I, I think I think your arguments in favour of private property are very plausible. If you know, the world was in stasis, now I, you know, the world's population has doubled in I don't know quite recent time but since the sixties. Yeah. Yes. So then new people. If we yeah. were like a risk game or a board game yeah. where, where it was constant, I could understand that. But so there's twice the number of people. They can't all inherit property rights from their parents, and that's part of why not? prosperity. How does that really? Well, so why can't they inherit property from their parents? There's more well, property about. Well, I know, okay, uh, maybe that's part of your answer, yeah, but no, I just want to know, if there's if more and more people uh, uh, competing for the same resources on the territory. Oh, well, I mean, resources are increasing all the time, and you can actually increase land in the sense of uh, areas that you can live on by building up higher or building out on the sea, floating islands, and what, I mean, that's the idea that land in the sense of livable spaces you know it was just, and anyway there the number of people that exist in the world could yeah, fit in us, texas liberalism would give an answer to it yeah if, if, um, if, if we're all divided yeah there's got to yeah. be more people if, if we're all divided into families uh, 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 with uh, living in sort of four bedroom house or whatever somebody says calculated we could all fit the entire population of the world could fit into Texas. There aren't that many people. It's, no, in, in fact, I mean, not only is there no overpopulation problem, there's probably an underpopulation problem because the more people there are, the more division of labour you get, including the discoveries that people make. We sh so it should really, um, it could well be that we actually have an underpopulation problem. Uh, uh, and if the state just got out of the way, there'd be more produced, uh, more for people to inherit, more productivity generally, all part of the wonderful libertarian future. This is just two Julian generations Simon. away. Two generations away. If you just get the state out of the way. So Julian Simon. But tell me about that, because that was a shot of two generations away. Why is it just two? Well, I mean, I mean I'm going on the basis that um, after the oh, Korean War, after the Korean War, oh, yeah, Korea oh, okay. was, it was a peasant yeah, economy. No, yeah. It was a peasant That's economy. Yeah. Two generations later, virtually top per capita income. Wow. Because the state got out of the way. Now the state started getting in the way again in in South Korea and therefore it slowed down. Of course also, they were picking up technology from the, so that was around in the world and I admit that there's, that's a factor. But when you think about the government spending half of the gross national product every year, okay some of it goes back to you but that is a hell of a drag Absolutely. Uh, and uh, well I mean people like Peter Singer and Derek Parfit who died earlier this year have this thing about they'll give 30% uh, of their academic uh, privilege salary away to the poor but the problems of the world are not caused by people not giving enough I'm Writing a, be writing an article on this soon, <laughs> you know, they're caused by the state getting being in the way. So the, the real problem is how should we just need to get the state out of the way? We don't need everybody to give till it hurts. Though why they think thirty percent of their salary hurts, I don't know. That's just to be, probably doesn't hurt very much. It's not hurting enough for for me. I'd like to see Singer hurt a lot more. Is <laughs> <laughs> yes, so in a libertarian society, I own myself. Yeah. So I could potentially sell a kidney or yeah. enter into a fight to the death. Yeah. Things like that. So that sort of makes me think about ethics and things like that. Is ethics incompatible with libertarianism? Say, for instance, cell research or animal research. It might offend me at the libertarian society that's going on. Or all these things, people are doing it. And how, how do we deal with those, those issues? Okay, there are, there's two. There's the human side here and then there's animals. With humans you do what you like with yourself on the property where it's allowed. Sure. I'm not going to allow fight dueling in my street. I will 
speak in the committee against mm -hmm. dueling in my street. But you can find a street where you want to duel with the, all your guns that you're so obsessed with. I don't know. Uh, uh, but, but basically, yes. Anyway, of course, the only reason there's a shortage of kidneys is because there isn't a free market in private in human body parts. If there are human free market in human body parts, there wouldn't be any shortage anyway. But uh, in principle, you should be able to say animals are a bit different. I admit that uh, gratuitous cruelty to animals is wrong. Uh, and uh, this is a separate principle from libertarianism, but it doesn't mean that it need conflict with libertarianism because I think the best thing to do is to, um, you know, shame and boycott people who are gratuitously cruel, and that will can quite powerfully, you know, if, for instance, all the big banks say, we're not going to allow anybody to bank with us who has sort of been found to be guilty of extreme animal cruelty. That's a big incentive not to be cruel because, you know, even though they're, all they're doing is denying you a benefit, but you've got no right to have a bank account. Uh, so boycotting and ostracism can, I think, be a completely libertarian way of stopping people doing things which are bad, but not don't necessarily conflict with libertarianism because libertarianism is for people it's not for animals uh no said hmm? people are animals. sorry i meant yes non non cubans non persons i think nozick said uh libertarianism for people and or uh, uh utilitarianism for animals and i've got some some, some sympathy with that i don't feel any moral compunction to maximise the utility of animals, but I certainly think gratuitous animal cruelty is wrong. Like uh, stem cell research or gene yeah. editing and things like that, that, you know, are, are, don't have a huge value, but there could be ethical dilemmas about that. A lot of folks don't, don't want to mess around with genes. Well, don't mess around them if you don't want to. No, but it's... Um, <laughs> other people, please. Other people yeah. Oh, yeah, well... Uh, and, their utility and their, their, their... Yeah, well, I mean, in that case, you said, if, if, if you really think that what somebody's doing is really dangerous, you're going to have to go to court and say, I think this is so dangerous to everybody else that it's got to be stopped. And there'll have to be a court case and you'll have to get expert witnesses in. I mean, is it the case that it's possible to use antibiotics so promiscuously that you're actually creating a danger to society that's the sort of thing that could be tested in court with expert witnesses and it could be you should no more be allowed to do that than you should should be allowed to build a nuclear weapon in your garage you know, so my garage nu my nuclear weapon it probably won't go off by mistake <laughs> it says no 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 sorry you're doing you're too much of a potential danger to other people that can't be allowed so but the things they can be if there's a real danger, it's got to be worked out in court and there'll be a winner and a loser. And the, whoever the loser is, the loser might not like it, but they, or you might just have to go a long way away and do it somewhere else. Um, I don't see how you can really stop people uh, doing genetic manipulation somewhere if they really want to. Um, and I don't also see that it's necessarily much of a very bad thing because it looks like it's going to... If we're going to solve all the diseases in the world, including ageing, which I hope we are, right. I hope, and I hope they get a bloody move on. <laughs> Please, get a move on, you scientists. Uh, then, yeah, a bit of genetic manipulation. Thank you. I'll take two. You mentioned the property rights a few times and different rules in different streets. Yeah. Is that practical? If my gun range is in a street where guns are allowed and it's surrounded by streets where guns aren't allowed, how do I get to my gun range with my gun? Well, you have to negotiate with the... Uh, the and it, you have to negocate with the owners. I don't want to negotiate with anti guns. Then you can't. <laughs> you can't. I mean, uh, yeah. If that's, you, that's, that's it. You just have to move um, the range. Uh, you'll have to move your range somewhere else, or my bullets. They don't. They, they don't appreciate these boundaries. You see, well, <laughs> I think the street, I'm just fine. Yeah. I mean, there's, 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 there's a sort of right of egress. Yeah, but I'm a criminal. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, 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 I'
Ay, yo, el fiel, no, güey. Fiel, no, 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 well, they might not think. Oh, the criminals might not think they might abide by it, but I didn't explain my theory of libertarian restitution, which is is quite nasty. And if you <laughs> you uh, you know um, you you'll get punished in proportion to uh, the amount of imposition you did, multiplied by the likelihood of you're getting away with it, so that uh, you could end up with um, something, you know, is, is basically it's exactly not worth being a criminal because the odds are such that it, it won't pay. And that will reduce crime considerably, I think. Whilst at the moment, under state law and order, people do tend to get a slap on the wrist. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, uh, I mean I, you see people... Um, committing terrorist acts because they've been released after having served a sentence for being a terrorist. And what was this sentence? Oh, free board and lodging um, with central heating and a gym to work out at it and conjugal visits and colour tone. You think, yeah, no, that was a punishment? That was a punishment? Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, that's, uh, that's, I mean, we've, we, we've gone from, with the state, we've gone from one extreme Hang a, hang a boy for stealing a loaf of bread to the other extreme, give somebody a slap on the wrist and free board and lodging for being a terrorist. And uh, the libertarian line is ultimately one of restitution as far as that is possible. But um, otherwise it's going to have to be, it, it may very well be quite draconian. So is it then property rights? So you wouldn't have a local council. So who's going to take my rubbish away? Using it private a, private dustman. So no. So oh no, because it, because because if you try fly tipping, you are going to be caught and punished uh, no, so no, severely no. that it is exact. At the moment, you get a slap on the wrist if you commit any crime. Basically, if there's anybody you don't like and you you don't mind spending a few years in prison, you can kill him if you like. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> if he really annoys you. It won't be like that in a libertarian society. You know, you can be sure that there's a that efficient private policing. You're much more likely to be caught. And when you are caught, uh, you are going to be facing something so awful that you uh, you think, oh, no, I'm not going to go down that route. Thank you very much. I'm just not going to risk it. Unless, of course, you are some kind of a suicide bomber, of course, and you don't care. I mean, you're going to blow yourself up anyway. But who knows what would be efficient ways to deter them. If we had efficient private deterrent agencies, they would be thinking of the best ways to deter people, and they're likely to come up in their competitive struggles with uh, varying degrees of efficiency, and then we can see which ones work and which ones don't work, and move towards the ones that do work, whilst at the moment, state passes a law, lands into John O'Groats, this is the law, and you're stuck with it, and then you can't see any different unless you look at other countries and you see, well, that country looks slightly better off and they have a slightly different rule, but now it's a different culture, so you can't be sure. Competing courts, competing Death laws. Death Death Death. Death. Uh, yeah, very quickly. No, 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 Death Death. Death. sorry, yes. So, like, uh, yeah, uh, maybe it's more of a comment than a question, but I uh, very much enjoyed your uh, point, yeah. uh, your presentation. Uh, it's just, I, I was just wondering, I know you don't like justificationism, but if I may say so, I thought you gave a very good justification for libertarianism. Yeah. And I think, if I mean, this came up earlier, I do strongly feel that it's basically a utilitarian argument you deliver. Because I think in most cases, because the way I see arguments for libertarianism, usually for either the natural rights camp, which is mm. what I'm not saying, or then the utilitarian, which is traditional, like Jeremy Penn for the mm. And uh, I think ultimately, my view is that I think the utilitarian one is ultimately the strong one. And the, the reason why I think you're, you've been very utilitarian in your argument is that you have never, in our discussion so far, hold up any uh, a natural right or personal right as absolute. You know, when, when property rights came up, there were certain mm -hmm. points where you said, well, okay. we have to see, you know, in well, the, uh, okay. the has to be an arbitration. Okay. Um, which, which, which I think makes sense. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and what that, in my view, means is that ultimately we have liberty because it works. Yeah. Because in, a, in an extensive society with so many people living together, the only way we can have peace and efficiency is by being libertarian. So it's basically because it's useful. And this is why natural rights explanations fall flat, because if you think about, let's say, uh, primitive societies, I'm not quite sure if we're still allowed to use that term, but let's say a society of hunter-gatherers, like 20 people living in the wilderness, they got no place for property rights. I mean, like yeah. someone picking more berries than the next guy, uh, having ownership of his berries and can trade them. It's just, I mean, these are institutions that only make sense once we have an extensive division, division of labor in an extensive society. And by then they become essential. And, and so I think ultimately your argument is the utilitarian one, which is the most powerful one. Well, and I think that also means that in certain cases we cannot come to these absolute rules like Nico would like to have them. Everybody in the planet has the right to move wherever they want to move to. That right may not exist because it's not utilitarian. It may not work in practice. And that's where I think ultimately it's a stronger defense of libertarianism. One more thing to it. Yeah. I think it ultimately ends in minarchism, not in anarchy. Yeah. Because I think ultimately it could be a minimal state could ultimately be justifiable on utilitarian grounds, where you say rather than have these guys have their own rules in street A, and the next rule you know people have different, and next row people have rules B because they decided their role and different, that become society becomes so fragmented that the costs of running such a society or that, that it, it works against the division of labor and cooperating in society. And therefore, this kind of unifying work of a minarchist state, a minimal state, not, uh, not the state we have today, uh, I think there's something to be said for it. So I think your argument has been utilitarian, and I think it leads to minarchy. Right, like, okay. So, look. Uh, there are two main kinds of utilitarianism. Preference utilitarianism, which is uh, more or less the kind that I've been using or assuming, it's not really utilitarianism at all. What it says is, you're better off if you get more of what you want, irrespective of how good you feel afterwards. Uh, if that is so, really, it's just respecting your autonomous choices, and that's why. Preference utilitarianism, which respects your autonomous choices, is conceptually strongly linked to liberty, which of course also respects your autonomous choices, uh, and therefore that conceptual link makes it difficult to separate the two. But if you're a real libertarian, sorry, utilitarian, if you're a hedonistic utilitarian, uh, then you get situations which um, you would want to reject. I mean, if I could uh, uh, put electrodes into your head and give you extreme pleasure and joy continuously, uh, but destroy all the reality of your life, your friends, your family, that doesn't exist anymore, but you've got wonderful utility. And you, you would say, oh yeah, but what about the utility? I say, okay, I'll put electrodes in their heads as well, and they'll just feel wonderful. Um, you may say, I don't want utility, I want, you, I want to, liberty to do what I want to do. I've got other things in my life that I value more than utility. Or, you know, I don't just want to feel good. I don't mind feeling good occasionally. I have a gin and tonic, thank you. But sometimes I want to stay sober and work out the solution to a philosophical problem or understand a scientific theory a bit better or just achieve a certain end. Well, and and we don't, we don't want those ends because they give us utility. We want them as ends in themselves. Now this is where Peter Singer has recently done something very, very strange. Having spent most of his life, the ethicist and animal rights figure, he spent most of his life advocating preference utilitarianism. Uh, you, it's better that people get what they want which I've always thought, I've been sympathetic to, but I thought <laughs> this is very, very close to libertarianism, respecting people's autonomous choices, except, of course, it's consequentialist and could, in principle, interfere with liberty. But now, he says, he thinks that people only want, um, ultimately, to achieve uh, certain states in the real world 
because of uh, a bias, because they know it's not safe to live in a world of fantasy or whatever. We have, so we have a sort of a natural built-in bias to uh, value reality, but really, he says, only hedonistic utility could matter. Really, that's all. That, and if you really, really were safe, you should plug in to uh, Nozick's uh, hedonistic fantasy machine. He said, but he hasn't. I don't think he's thought, thought this through properly, because if you think through the, the the consequences of hedonistic utilitarianism, you can simply be uh, a complete moron. You don't need any intelligence or anything this, at all. This, and all you are is a is a brain lying in some kind of uh, decayed, maggoted body. You can feel incredibly intense pleasure and incredibly intense happiness because those two things do seem to be separate. Uh, the drugs or well, the hormones in you in your body are different. Happiness and apparently you can have them happiness and pleasure. If you can have happiness and pleasure, you make you wonder if there are other things that we good things in addition. But I oh know. Uh, would you opt for life? as that moron who can experience enormous happiness and pleasure but nothing else you've got no, you've got no understanding you've got no family you've got no friends ultimately if what if all that matters is pleasure that would be the good life that can't be the good life uh it was mill who, who said you know it's better to be a philosopher unsatisfied than a satisfied pig or a fool and if the pig or fool disagree it's because they don't know what to they can't experience what it's like to be a dissatisfied philosopher. I can tell you, it's bloody good. Um, so, uh, hedonistic utilitarianism, if we consider the logical consequences of it, is ghastly because there are things we want apart from... OK, nobody wants to be in agony. And if, you, if, you, if the agony is so bad, you might say, OK, I'd rather not exist. But the idea that the only thing that is really valuable is hedonistic pleasure can't be right. It, that cannot be uh, what we want. Even when you look at the logical consequences, there are other goals that we had in life, and I'm afraid there's a certain amount of um, uh, uh, sort of there are competing values. You, there is no one thing in terms of which to which they can all be reduced. Uh, but certainly, I think hedonistic utilitarianism is refuted by the idea of just being uh, a, a, an idiot who's got plugged into a happiness regime. Nobody would want that. Nobody would consider that to be a good life. And they'd say, I'd rather suffer in all kinds of ways than be plugged into that machine. So that means you're left with preference utilitarianism. Now, preference utilitarianism, as I said, it's not really a utilitarianism at all. It is a consequentialism here. We're giving people more of what they want. But what they want, is often knowledge as an end in itself, or uh, any you know relationships partly as ends in themselves. So it's so, so closely connected conceptually to um, libertarianism in the in the so far as you're respecting that person's wants, irrespective of the consequences. Just what that, as I said, it's it's you're not really. Uh, opting for something utterly different from libertarianism. It's, it's, uh, it's not as different and distinct as, as, as it looks once you do that. And once you, if you accept the argument that nobody wants hedonistic utilitarianism, not really. Bit of pleasure now and then, thank you. No problem. But uh, nothing but, irrespective of the cost, no way. Nobody wants that. Oh. I do actually know one or two drug addicts probably would take that, you know, but they fall on into a, the slough of despond. Pat? Yes. Oh, just time. to pick you up on that last point. Just yeah. time again. Yeah. Um, right. Hedonistic. What do you call it? Hedonistic. Hed hedonistic utility. It's the yes, idea that so only pleasure yeah. and happiness matter, nothing else. Sounds great to me. Yes. Who's, where do you get the idea 
that yeah. no, either nobody wants that or it's a bad thing. Or... Oh, okay. Um, would you? Who told you? No, no, yeah, no, it's a thought experiment. I'll give you the thought experiment. Uh, if I could plug you into a machine, so yes. And in that machine... Electric chair. It's going to say there's nothing. Yeah. No, no. In that machine, you will have just wonderful pleasure and happiness the whole time. You won't have any friends. You'll never do anything in the world. You won't understand anything ever new. Ever, all that will happen is, is that you'll feel pleasure and happiness. But there will be nothing else to your life other than that buzz of, ah... Oh, Nothing else. Would you want to plug into that machine? Yeah. <laughs> you have the option. Yeah. I would want to plug in maybe now and then, a bit of recreation. But I wouldn't want to plug in and leave my life behind and, and just be zonked out. It'd be like being a drug addict. Have a timer. Where it's the best drugs you've ever had and the high never stops. But you will never achieve or understand anything new ever never have another relationship never do anything with your life at all you will simply be like uh but isn't that what you would be doing anyway wouldn't you be so achieving those aims by that by those means sure but you won't. i don't do i don't try to understand uh the answers to sort of philosophical problems because I'm trying to make myself uh, high. If I, if I wanted to make myself high, I'd take drugs to get myself high. I mean, that's, it's just a different thing. Yeah. Intellectually interesting uh, 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 problems are something that you can take an interest in as an end in themselves. Now, there is pleasure involved. Yeah. There is pleasure involved. It, it sounds to me that in a nutshell, yeah. You've gone beyond the materialism. You've you, you made, you made some kind of moral decision, ra rather like someone who decides. Oh, right. someone like you can plug in if you want to. Well, I won't no, stop no, you. No, 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 no. You've you made, you made some kind of moral decision. I'm not against people yeah, yeah. making moral Like the people that, like, that, that, that decide oh, what adverts we can or can't see on the tube now, on the, the underground, where yeah. we have Sharia law. What could allow you to see exactly the same kind of thing as that. Well, this is bad for you. This is good for you. Because I know it's bad for you. No, 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 no. I'm giving you. I'm giving. You're talking like the man. No, 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 no. I'm giving you. No, I'm saying you. I'm telling you my reaction to this thought experiment. I'm and I'm assuming that other people will have a similar reaction that they won't want to lead a life of sort of a sort of. Com comatose delight, but I could be wrong. You and are. if you then, but I'm not banning you. I'm not banning you from doing it. I was just saying I would like it, and I don't think most people would because most people, their their sole and only goal in life is not to be as happy and as pleasured as possible the whole time. That's not. They've got other things to do that interest them. Absolutely. Yes, but those other things that are made as, <laughs> effectively a statistical analysis no, that not. they would be happier no. with those things than that, what they would with the most immediate... No, 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 look, 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 listen. I could plug an electrode into your brain that will make you happier, literally feel happiness at an intensity that you never experienced before, or you could simply say, well, I'm quite interested in engaging in this hobby and if I say, yeah, yeah, but this will make you happier. And you say, no, 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 I'm, ju I'm just, I like this hobby more than, I'm, I'm not just trying to do this to be as happy as possible. I, I don't mind being a bit happy now and then. I don't mind having a bit of pleasure. But the idea that, that all you ever trying to do is to get as much happiness as possible and as much pleasure as possible, that's not what people are trying to do. They've got diverse, they have diverse ends. Happiness and pleasure compete with all of their diverse, as long as they've got enough happiness and pleasure that they can get on with their other ends, they're, they're good. I think you're wrong. That's all right. So right. That's, that's the, uh, <laughs> thanks for that then. Uh, I think uh, we can continue this in the bar. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Thanks a lot, John.